My guest today is, is Jamie Baum, flutist and composer extraordinaire. And she's been one of my very special collaborators in my group Shiro's. Um, we met in the recording studio pretty much about six years ago and been on many adventures since then, tours and more recordings. And one important concept of my group is to include all the contributors, not just with their instrumental voices, but also with their compositional voices. And Jamie has been one who has honed her compositional voice, especially over several decades and with several groups in, in a, on a very high level. So what I want to focus on today is first get to know Jamie and then talk about the recordings that ended up on our collaborative recordings and, and some of her music. So welcome, Jamie Baum. Thank you. So glad to be here with you virtually. It's a virtual meeting. And so why, why don't you tell everybody first, in a nutshell, a little bit about yourself. And then we'll actually, that no pun intended, will be the first tune we'll also talk about. <laughs> okay. Well, I live in New York City and I've been living here for quite a while. And I am a flute player and composer. And really, I think, you know, I went to school in Boston at New England Conservatory and then moved to New York. And when I started you know, when I went to school, I quickly was told, especially in those days, you know, my first two jazz teachers were really Rand Blake and Jackie Byard, you know, and got to study with a lot of other people. But it was really clear, made clear to me, both by my teachers and the scenario, you know, the scene at the time and the clubs and the whole thing, you know, that I was not going to have a lot of success just playing flute. You know, in those days there weren't, you know, the jazz standard form was really the usual saxophone quartet or trumpet quartet. And the concept of the other instruments, you know, being able to carry, be a front person, you know, and carry a recording or a whole gig or a festival or something you know was pretty limited you know you didn't have so-called all these miscellaneous instruments and flute is kind of a weird one because there were people that doubled but you know that's a whole nother pet peeve of mine that you know so many of them of the doublers didn't really play flute very well you know and but it seemed to be accepted while they would never go out there and play flute that way you know so but anyway I I quickly realized that if I wanted to work both being a woman, of course, at that time, and a flute player, that I was really going to have to probably create my own bands or my own situations. And so I always had written music. I mean, I didn't really write, I guess, at that point, you know, but I always... I didn't really consider myself a writer, but I always noodled and I heard melodies and I came up with melodies and I came up with songs. But so I never really saw them as separate. You know, I didn't think, oh, this person is a composer or I should compose or play or improvise. It all just seemed that's what you do. You write and you come up with your own songs and learn other songs and whatever. So it was always something that just seemed part of my experience, musical experience. So when I was at New England Conservatory, so many people said, oh, you, you, you really should double on saxophone. You know, you're not going to ever be able to make a living playing flute or be part of the scene. So I did um, start to take some sax lessons with this very famous sax teacher. And this, his name is eluding me at this moment, but it'll come to me. But anyway, I decided to split my major into composition and flute because I knew I really wanted to do that. And I knew even though I had taken some sax that I started playing flute so late so it was just there was no way I was going to be able to do all of that and I just always felt like I had a lot of catching up to do on flute so anyway I I really always sort of did both and and I came to quickly learn that even though I started playing flute so late and certainly playing jazz so late because when I was in high school I didn't really play and there weren't all these 
jazz bands and jazz camps and opportunities to learn and certainly not much for a woman or a girl at that time because I was one of two women in the jazz department kind of the whole time I was there so I and I wasn't good so I sort of fit all those stereotypes you know so I sort of you know I, I was writing too and I sort of started noticing that if I wrote some interesting music a lot of good musicians would want to play with me and so I would get gigs and I they liked this music I was writing and it was kind of odd to me at the time I like I just I started so late that I didn't really have much confidence in my playing or my composing or anything you know I just it was something I wanted to do but I never got any accolades or encouragement and in fact my parents were thought when I got my acceptance to New England that it might be a mistake because I didn't get in anywhere else <laughs> So anyway, it was very a revelation to me. I remember when I applied for my first composition grant in Boston, you know, as I was graduating this Massachusetts fellowship that I actually was three, one of three finalists for the prize, you know, and it's named the arranger that arranged for Miles Davis, you know, that oh, taught me. Yeah, he was actually on the panel. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so it was like, you know, and, and the people I was playing with were like, you got that, you know, so so everybody was as surprised as I was. Why? But it was very encouraging for me. And I actually, in those days, I got an NEA study grant to study composition. I actually got three of them one year to study with Tom McKinley, who was my teacher at Manhattan, I mean, at New England, who was a composer, and then with Richie Byrack and, and Dave Liebman. And with Big Nudge of all, you know, the, you have accomplished a lot and, and, you know, you should get your due and all the great things you, you've been doing. But it's interesting. So getting to in a nutshell, <laughs> when um, I decided to put this group together, you were one of the ones that came highly recommended. You were very enthusiastic. And, you know, I was looking for the music and I said, send me some things. And, and you send me some of the pieces from the latest recording and, and some Somehow, you know, I decided this piece in a nutshell, it just seemed so exciting and had this rumbling bass, dun, 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 you know, that was <laughs> going on and, and these counterpoint melodies on top of it. And we're going to listen to to this in a second, but I wanted to share with you a little bit about the background and how we recorded this and what an interesting coincidence it was that we were able to pull off this really complex piece. <laughs> <laughs> with day of rehearsal of all kinds of other things except that piece probably <laughs> so and and one of the coincidences was that we had Linda O with us in the studio fantastic bass player who by accident had recorded that piece with you before on on a different recording and that was a crucial element because this bass line is very very difficult so I want you to add a few things about that composition and the background and how you put that together. Mm -hmm. Well, the inspiration was a couple of things. One, that bass line was similar to a bass line that a friend of mine had written. I mean, his piece was completely different, but um, I was playing in this other guy's band, Glenn White, and he had written this piece and it had sort of that kind of driving bass that had a sort of a, almost a rock vibe. And I really liked it and I wanted to do something with that. So I said, do you mind if I steal a little bit of this? And he's like, no, oh, I steal your stuff all the time, you know? So, you know, it was really different. If you heard his tune, you'd probably be like, I don't hear anything similar. But you know how that is when we get ideas. But actually the inspiration for that piece was, I actually remember, um, it was a very funny time in New York City where, you know, I think it was, I, maybe it was Bloomberg was it back then or maybe it was um, when I wrote when I actually wrote the piece maybe it was Giuliani but they they had decided they were going to really change Times Square and I live near Times Square and I've been living near Times Square for a long time and when I first moved here and for many many years it was very seedy it was really you just didn't want to go there and so you know there's a lot of 
porno shops and and it's nothing like people know it is now I mean of course there was Broadway but also 42nd Street had a lot of porno shops and strip joints and certainly 8th Avenue you know and so the funny whole funny thing about that I used to tell this story when I would play this piece with my band was that you know for a long time it was like that and so I would avoid going to walking you know even if I had to go to 5th Avenue I would take the bus even if it was like four blocks away because I didn't want to walk through <laughs> Times Square and then all of a sudden there was this really cool period where they decided they were going to clean up and everything closed and then for like a year or two before they started building there were these like pop-up like art galleries and haiku where it would used to say girls 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 there was like a haiku poem you know or these like little you know art galleries where it was like porno shops you know so then I started walking and then the funny story is then once it became like the you know Disneyfy Times Square now I take the bus because I can't stand walking through all the tourists so we're back where I used to be but it was really meant to sort of give the vibe of living in New York City mm -hmm. you know just the intensity mm -hmm. like of you know just going out the door and boom it like hits you in the face right away so here it is in a nutshell as recorded on the whole world in her hands with Linda O on bass Jamie Baum on flute Ray Udreger from the trombone Lakeisha Benjamin on the saxophone, Ariana Fanning on the drums. I'm for her sake on piano. Thank you. <laughs> Here it is.
niece, Jamie. I, I really love this rambling base and getting it, us into the mode. Here's New York City and here's how it feels like. And, you know, one of the cool things about jazz is that we can do this, that we can paint this image, we can paint this picture and the listener can hear it and go for it. So after we recorded this, you know, the group started going out. We had some tours. And when we went re got ready for the second recording, we actually came off nice two-week tour. We were playing off of each other. And Ingrid Jensen was able to join us and, and play the trumpet on this piece. And so we recorded this second piece of yours called Waning. Mm -hmm. And all I know that it's dedicated to Wayne Shorter. And it's another great, great example of these woven lines into each other, this counterpoint that you do. It's part of my short stories pieces that I wrote, which mm -hmm. sort of came out of uh, inspiration or pressure from Richie Byrack because he wanted to, he a, was a teacher and then mentor and really close friend and we were going to do a tour. And he said, you know, I want to do some of your music, but you know, enough of this long compositions that you do with your septet, you know, and these weird meters and all this stuff, you know, so I want you to write short tunes, like what you came up doing and how you learned, you know, which even though it's kind of odd, people always ask me that I haven't really put out any recordings of standards, you know, I spent years and years and years doing standard gigs and, you know, so many. And so that's really my background and which I think is important for composers because I really think it really informs melody, how you uh, approach melody, you know, because I, I, I'm a melody person, you know, no matter what I do, I'm really thinking melody. And so, and I'm sure some of that comes from that. And so I think by line writing, you actually make the group sound larger in that way. And there are more things going on that are interesting. And so when I really, when I write, I act a lot of the time, I don't know what the harmonies are going to be until that, well, I'm close to done because I'll write a melody and maybe the bass line and I'll write another line and I'll see what's going on and then I sit back and I go, oh, that's actually what I was hearing. Or maybe I need to reconfigure the chord changes for the blowing because it may not be as open or as much fun, but it really works for the melody, you know? So I really always thinking that way in terms of the bass line as a voice, as a melody, you know, voice leading is so important and as well as the inner voices. Someone who's really amazing is that is Kenny Wheeler. You know, if you check out his tunes, because they're always surprising. You know, the melody seems so simple, and then you check out the changes, and there a lot of times the melody is an extension of, of the chord or something different. And so, you know, that that's always been kind of important to me in terms of hearing that balance of the different lines, you know, going on to create interest. So that's kind of, you know, and, and also, you know, when Richard she was chiding me to write these short tunes. He said, go back and check out those people that were such huge influences on you, you know, and of course, through composing Wayne Shorter, you know, I mean, his tunes are just so interesting and so beautiful melodically, but also interesting harmonically. And as Monk, you know, Monk is another one, you know, who really huge influence because there's so much they say in such a short amount of time. And people love to play them because because the motives in the melody are so strong, it gives you a lot of material to play off of or work off of and make it different every time. And of course, the chain, you know, there's always a surprise in there that's unexpected. And there's always, you know, so much balance and it, it, color. And, and so, you know, that's what I've been kind of aspiring to in writing these short stories, these short tunes. It's like, wow, let me see if I can write something like 12 bars, but it'd be really interesting and make somebody want to keep playing it because it's challenging or, or there's so many different things you can do. So that was really one of the first the tunes that I did and oddly enough I brought it into Richie and he didn't want to play it because he said oh. it was too hard <laughs> oh. <laughs> well he didn't really say it was too hard but somehow we never kept playing it and I think he just wanted to play his music but the nice thing about it was it got me to write some things and use it for other purposes so that's really cool yeah let's let's give Waning a listen and and so we can actually give out the secret it is a blues in disguise but it's that's very right. well disguised <laughs> 
So here's from the uh, Shiro's recording, our 2018 release, Waning by Jamie Baum.
a blues in disguise, isn't it? I wonder if anybody <laughs> was able to, to hear all the blues changes, but it is. So thank you, Jamie, for contributing Waning. That was really, really great tune to play on and to be performing. And of course, then on our new release on Eternal Dance, we had, of course, another Jamie tune. And hopefully in the future on our next releases, at least one or many of them, because I, I just adore the writing style. So Thank the you. <laughs> well, it is, it is really cool. Well, right back at you. <laughs> so this one that we have on Eternal Dance started out as short stories number seven, <laughs> because it was part of that short stories series, but we renamed it eventually, or you renamed it to Seas of Change and, and dedicated to Greta Thunberg for her environmental activism. And talking about pictures, you know, the picture that I see when we play it and do it, it has this ostinato, so this same little, it's not little, but the same chord progression goes all the way through the whole piece, so it's this bass level. And then on top of it, because the bass notes change in the way those harmonies are interpreted, it becomes a different harmonic series. And so A, it's this change over the bass ostina or over the basses, and then B, the way it was arranged, it's not your usual, okay, you play the head and then play a solo, and you play solo, and you play solo, and then we'll play the head out. But you and Ray Oud go at it <laughs> and, and play off each other, and, and, and I'll take a little bit, and then we'll have Lainey on the out head. So anything you have to contribute on here on the writing style and set us up for, for this piece. Well, I, you know, I'm always sort of looking for just different inspiration or different approaches to writing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't always want to start with the melody or start with a bass line or, you know, so a lot of times when I come up with ideas, sometimes it's just, you know, I'm sitting at the piano and noodling. I had gone to hear somebody play at the jazz standard and they did something with like a chord ostinato that really struck me that I liked. So of course, you know, when you hear something fleeting, you know, and you go home and you write something, it may have not much to do with what you heard because it's hard to remember but I, I do remember kind of being inspired by that and I, I like the idea of having this you know we always think of an ostinato often in the bass but this was kind of there's also the ostinato of a repeating chord progression but so everything else is going on around it and so how can you I mean the challenge with ostinatos as I know you know and any composer is it can get boring really fast so so, and just for those listeners that don't know what an ostinato is, it's a repeating figure, basically. You know, so many tunes are built, built on that, but it's sort of the question and the challenge is, is how to get in and out of it in a tune. You know, like when? When have I heard enough of it? And, and what can I do with this so that it doesn't get really boring? So this time, the ostinato wasn't in the bass. It was sort of in the voicing part. And so, you know, I just thought... I also was feeling like... I wanted to, you know, when I write a lot of times, if I'm writing for, say, my one of my groups, I'm sort of thinking, okay, I've got this type of tune, this type of tune, this type of tune, you know, I really need a ballad, or I really need this kind of thing. And I was really thinking that I wanted something to feature the bass, where the bass played the melody. So that's kind of, you know, was sort of how that was conceived initially. And then when it got to the blowing, you know, I sort of felt like I wanted to continue with that ostinato, but we've heard it so much already in this one way so by changing the bass notes or changing where that voicing laid in a chord you know it could be the chord tones or it could be the you know upper extensions or it could be you know then it would at least make it more interesting and give it different color so that was kind of what I was thinking about with that and and then you know sometimes I know right away how I'm 
want to title a tune and other times the more I play something it more reminds me of something or I get drawn to something and I think it was about that time you know when Greta Thunberg did her voyage across the sea you know and I, I was just kept seeing that ostinato is like the seas and the line going sort of up and down in this boat you know and, and I thought that she was so inspiring you know in 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 her her voice and what she did so seas of change you know seas of change yeah absolutely that's that's a great image to paint too so when we listen to this imagine Greta on her voyage across the sea on these waves and waves <laughs> enjoy and really listen for this amazing interplay between Jamie and Ruth on this tune here's seas of change from eternal dance on high notes along record Thank you. 
from your zip tech plus with <laughs> with with all these different voices that you put together which is beyond our group where we have a distinct combination but there is many more instruments from and you can explain that in a minute but there's one piece a beautiful gorgeous ballad on your recent britches album on sunny side and it's called song without words which plays into our theme that you know with instrumental you can evoke these images so i i would love for us to listen to that and and give us a little introduction on how this came about and and the different voices you have in there so i as we talked about a little bit before i have a septet plus which is an eight piece it was septet but we added another person and for the first just very briefly for the first 10 years i had the band i was really focused on using influences from contemporary classical composers that in my writing so i had a little bit of a different band with like a trumpet player and Al, um ralph alessi and george colligan and doug yates and during that time i did a lot of traveling touring to south asia i went to india Nepal and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and I've been you know a couple of times and worked with Indian musicians and Nepali musicians and so I got very influenced and was really affected by that music and so when I some of the guys in my band started getting busy so around 2010 I made some changes and I wanted to go a little bit more in that direction using those influences we did one recording called in this life which had some influences by Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, who's a Pakistani quality vocalist. And then I got a grant to, based on a proposal, to write some music using finding some connections between South Asian music and Jewish music and Makam or Muslim music. And so my band has an incredible trumpet player, vocalist, Amir El Safar, who studied Makam and went, his family's from Iraq, and he went over there and studied for years in Egypt and Iraq. And so fast forward, so this version of my band for the last 10 years has him and uh, Sam Sadagursky, who's a wonderful bass clarinet player who you hear on this piece, and has Brad Shepik on guitar, and I have French horn, Chris Comer, and John Escreet, wonderful piano player, and Zach Lober on bass and Jeff Hirschfield on drums. And so, you know, one of the goals was incorporating some of these different influences into the music. Um, on this recording bridges. And so this particular song I wrote when I was at McDowell, this artist colony, and I had been on tour and really busy crazy for a few months. And before that, uh, when the C my last CD had just come out, my father had passed away and I never really had an opportunity to reflect or grieve because I went right on tour. And so when I was at McDowell, you stay in these amazing cabins in the woods, you have your own cabin with grand piano. And so I, I it was first time that I really had a chance to let those emotions come to me and so I wrote this piece and in honor of my father and it was kind of interesting because I kept hearing this piece that is played in the synagogue once a year on the highest holiday Yom Kippur and it's this very beautiful piece and it was really what kind of inspired this because it's just gorgeous piece and solemn. And and it was funny, it really inspired the piece. It's called Nidre, I'm sorry, it's called, called Nidre. And I remember it was so funny because I couldn't think of what to call the piece. And right after I got back from McDowell, I was watching some special, all of a sudden I'm watching PBS and there was a special on Kol Nidre. And you had all these rabbis and cantors from all over the world talking about this piece. And the, to make a long story short, the genesis was that during Holocaust and around that time, the Jews weren't allowed to, they could, they could either sing the piece or chant the words, but they couldn't sing the piece with the words for some reason. It was banned or not allowed. Like it could be played on a cello or it could be said, but they couldn't sing it. And so the rabbis had to decide what was more a direct line to God 
Would it be chanting the words or having the music played? And they decided that to have the song without words. So that gave me the title of the piece. And it was originally going to be just instrumental, but then I went to hear Amir's group, which is called Two Rivers, I think. His amazing group where he uses jazz musicians and musicians from Iraq, you know, like a lot of the influences in there. And I heard him sing, and I never heard him sing before. And I was like, oh my God, I have to have him sing on this piece. You know, it was just perfect. Not only that, but, you know, here I'm writing this, sort of goes along, you know, I'm writing this piece based on this Jewish thing, and he's kind of singing with kind of a makam thing. You know, and we had talked a lot about the connection between Muslims and Jews, you know, that it was really great for so many years and you know and also the connection between the music in fact there's another piece on the recording called from the well that we kind of he helped me write you know that is based on a scale that is found in both makam and jewish music so anyway i just when i hear him saying that i just lose it every time <laughs> So that's I know the story. I know I know what you mean. It's it's very very deep singing and you know it's interesting because I know his sister pretty well who happens right. to live in Bloomington and is the viola teacher of my daughter. That's right. I always forget that. <laughs> and I know their history because you know Amir was here too. He went to school when early on in the 90s when, ah. when I was in school. And oh. I thought he went to school in Chicago, Chicago but I did I didn't realize he went well to they, they came here too and they had salam and then uh, you know he moved out but yeah I, I know what you mean there's there's a depth to this uh, singing that's uh, just beyond what we learn to do so let's let's have a good listen and I think this is one to just close your eyes and 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 imagine this what, what you was just explaining to us this this chanting so this is song without words from Jamie Baum's album Bridges on sunny side enjoy yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks for listening to Talking Jazz with Monica Hersick. Our special guest today was Jamie Baum. The music was from The Whole World in Her Hands, Eternal Dance, and She Rose, and by Jamie Baum's Bridges.